ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. It's such a wonderful place with such wonderful people. So I'm really grateful that you invited me and we can spend this night together. I would say these are one of those late nice Indian summer nights when the best option is to go out and spend the time with a nice walk along the river or in the nature. But you and me, we chose something else for tonight and this is common in us because it seems we both want to learn or talk or discuss something about political Islam. Uh, let me start with a bit of game with you, if you wouldn't mind to participate. Uh, let it be an association game. What comes into your mind when I say the word Islam? I would be happy if you could just say in some words. It can be anything. It can be positive, negative, the so-called stereotype, or anything what comes into your mind. I would be interesting to hear. So, some words in your mind? Just say it. Siege. What is it? Siege. Siege, okay. Next one. Middle East. Middle East. Submission. Submission. Violence. Violence. My neighbors. Neighbors, okay. Yeah, can be any, any Arabic word in your mind? Salam alaikum. Problematic. What? Problematic, Problematic. okay. Shatan. Anything? Huh? Shatan. Mm -hmm. Okay, some more. Jihad. You're doing well. Jihad, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, you, you know much more than, than you would think of. And actually, that's what we try to initiate at the Center for the Study of Political Islam, uh, some sort of self-education. And tonight, I would like to show you some directions, some guide, how to do self-study on Islam, and especially on political Islam. So, why do we care about political Islam? You probably all in your head something about it, that's why you're here tonight. I can give you the answer on that question straight away, but I promise I will stay a bit longer, yeah? So, because it also cares about us. What do I mean by that? Did you know that when you look on the doctrine of political Islam, the basic scriptures, if you do a statistical analysis of the text, more than 51% of the scriptures is dealing with non-Muslims about us. So this is what I would like to present you tonight. What political is in Islam? We say everything in Islam is political, which is about the non-Muslims. And I would like to show you how you can gain out that knowledge from the very basic doctrine of Islam. What matters in Islam is the political part, because that is what dealing with us. You have to understand that Islam is not just a religion. And from all the words you, you put out, I could understand that you also have an understanding of the political aspect of this so-called Islam. So this is a complex civilization with cultural um, uh, context and everything what you find in Islam is affecting the, the, the most detailed part of your daily life, even if you're Muslim or a non-Muslim. Now, when you uh, starting to deal with the topic of uh, political Islam, or just Islam, you usually run into three very different points of views. What is interesting that what we most of us knowing from the media, uh, from the politicians, or even from our neighbors, or from uh, a school, is a very much one-sided, one kind of point of view. Let me tell you a very authentic story. There is a hadith, so-called hadith collection of Muhammad life stories, and uh, there is one in it. It's uh, from the collection of Bukhari, which is the most authentic source of Islam uh, about the Prophet life. So the story goes, uh, there was a day in Medina when Muhammad and that time his uh, 12 years old wife Aisha was sitting all day long and watching how uh, 800 Jews had were cut off. This was a big celebratory day. It was the victory of, of a battle which Muhammad was leading. And it, was, it, it, it is the story from the book of Bukhari. Now, how can you uh, think of this story? You can think of it three different points of view. 
The first would be, let's say, a very authentic Islamic point of view. This was a battle. Muhammad is the perfect example of every Muslim, and this was a victory. So this is a victorious event. There is another point of view, which is we call the kafir point of view, and this is rarely remembered recently. The kafir means the non-Muslim, and everyone who is not accepting Allah as the only God and Muhammad as his prophet is basically a kafir. Now, I, as a kafir, I would say, looking back to this event 1,400 years ago, it was actually a massacre. It was actually a murder. It was something against humanity. And this is a kafir point of view. Is it a judgment? Is it a fact? It's an opinion, it's a view. You can decide what your view on it. There is a third point of view, that's what we very often meet. And this says, oh, it's just one of the historical events. We saw even worse, don't judge it. Okay, we saw even worse, right? What else, let me think, crusades. Yeah, even worse, yeah? So. This is another thing I would like to show you how this point of view represented in recent uh, times. This is a map and showing you some battles, all the battles which happened throughout the 200 years when the Crusades went on in the Middle East region. Now, this is what we still feel bad about as Christians. This is what is still a very sad historical uh, series of event. But what we forgot about this event, that it was a reaction. The Crusades was a reaction. First time in history, Christians on the Middle East asked help from Christians from other parts of the Mediterranean, and they came to help. What was the threat? Any guess? Islam. So let me show you something. <coughs> Okay, so this map is showing you how Islam spread through battles from the 7th century until the end of the Ottoman Empire. What is interesting to see is that every red dot on this map is pointing to a battle where people died and basically resulted these areas becoming Islamic. Now, if you check the map, you can see that the uh, North African region, the Middle East, very quickly become um, uh, Islam. But if you see the other part of the Mediterranean, is a huge lot of battles there. Why? Because there was some um, opposition there. These were, at that time, uh, Christian countries, and they were defending their culture, their civilization. Now, what is interesting to see that uh, wherever Islam uh, came into a, an, uh, an area in the history, and this is something which Muhammad himself uh, taught and, and presented with his example, they were always offered for the people living in that area a choice. The choice was either convert to Islam or staying with their religion if they were Christians or Jews and paying a jizya, which was a tax. It was actually, Muhammad was not only a religious leader, this is an aspect you have to understand. He was a very smart politician and economical expert, let's say. He came up with the idea that while he is on war and doing jihad with his jihadis, uh, he will not have time to go on the field and, and, and uh, produce um, food. So what he decided to do is that offering a choice for those people who would do the job for him and would feed his soldiers. So therefore the jizya was an option for Christians and Jews or to converting Islam and becoming a jihadist and later on that's what went on throughout centuries uh, in the, in the uh, footsteps of Muhammad by uh, great, we can say great famous leaders uh, like the uh, sultans of the Ottoman Empire. This actually was the so-called dimmi status, what uh, was offered for many. And why I showed you this map, and you can see a beautiful comparison here. Uh, you have to understand that the, most of these green areas were Christian. 
Uh, but also, don't forget, Afghanistan was Buddhist before uh, Islam arrived. Pakistan was a Hindu country. Iran was Zoroastrian, uh, Zoroastrianism was there. So all these countries, after Islam appeared, uh, according to the complexity of this ideology, which offered uh, answers, solutions for the, every aspect of life, uh, this uh, combined with some, let's say, jihadi or more violent uh, act, uh, forced people to either become Muslim or submit them to Islam. Now, I was talking about the three point of views, just to jump back for this for a moment, and I just wanted to show you that we don't really hear much about apologies about those 1400th century from the Islamic world side. But we still feel uh, embarrassed and bad about the, um, the, the Crusades, which is fine because there were terrible things going on there as well. So I just wanted to show you that when uh, the emphasis is coming on that, that uh, for, oh, don't, uh, don't judge anything what happened in the life of Muhammad because uh, we did even worse, you have to understand that there is a big difference in ethical values, in acts, and in history. Now, so when we talk about jihad, violence, and other things, the next thing that always coming up is that, okay, but what all these things have to do with Islam? This is nothing to do with Islam. I brought you some signs here. Uh, the first one is the sign of the Boko Haram. Uh, the second one is the flag of Saudi Arabia. The third one is an ISIS flag. The fourth one is uh, just an underground civil organization called the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, what is common in the flags, uh, not mentioning here now the Muslim Brotherhood sign, but there is an Arabic sentence there. Uh, it's a bit graphically different, but this is the same. And do you know what is written on these flags? Do, do you ever put this question up when you watch the, um, the TV or you went to eat a gyros, what would be those signs on the wall? It's very interesting because they're all pointing to one direction. And this is the so-called Sahada and Shahada. And uh, Shahada is actually the testimony of being a Muslim or testimony of Islam, submitting to Islam. And the sentence says, Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his prophet. OK, let me ask one thing. Uh, if you tomorrow would decide, OK, I want to convert to Islam. I like the whole idea. You know what would you have to do? Do you know how to convert Islam? Any of you tried? <laughs> you tried. <laughs> now you see, you, you try it only once. Uh, actually, you have to understand Islam is a religion that once you enter, you never leave. It's forbidden, and according to the doctrine, uh, the punishment is death for leaving Islam. So, so you don't know how to convert. Okay. I tell you, it's very, very simple. You just have to repeat this sentence, Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his prophet, in Arabic, uh, in the presence of witnesses, three times. Done. You are a Muslim then. So that's, that's how easy to become a Muslim. Uh, why is it important regarding to our topic? I would like to show you five different areas that you can investigate yourself at home as well, and you can start your self-study on that topic. Uh, and these are key pillars for understanding Islam. So I would like to go through five points, and this will be the following. If nothing else but these five words, you can take it home with you. The first is the trilogy, which refers to the doctrine. And I would like to answer on the question, what is Islam and where do we start, yeah? The second one is kafirs. I mentioned kafirs, this is we are the non-Muslims. So I would like to ask the question, why is it important uh, to know Islam? And then we will see what comes from the Islamic doctrine. This is what I point out as political Islam. And about dualism, I would like to tell you today why is it really easy to understand Islam. You have been told this is really difficult. You have to talk Arabic. You will never understand anything if not blah, blah. 
Actually, did you realize that only 14% of the Muslim population of the world speaks Arabic? The rest is like in Pakistan, they speak Urdu, yeah? So, why is it easy to understand Islam? I will tell you the secret, and in the end, I would like to tell you the main concept of Islam about submission. It, this word also came up. Before I start, where do we start? Uh, can you tell me uh, what do you think? Who is the most authentic uh, teacher of Islam, or let's say the the expert, the real experts you can rely on? You you probably read or heard a lot of about a lot of experts. We actually have two in mind, so I'm just. Uh, quizzing now you that, give me some names, who would be the best expert of Islam? Hmm? Okay. Ayatollah, yeah, yeah. Or Spencer and Dr. David Wood. Okay. Yeah, a lot of ideas, okay. I tell you who we believe the two most authentic experts of Islam. The first one, called Allah, and the second one, called Muhammad. And that's where you start, okay? So that's where you start. Okay, let's see, where to find Allah and his words. This is the Quran. The Quran is actually came through Gabriel to Muhammad in, in some uh, daydreams, let's say, and uh, the full Quran came down to Muhammad from Allah. What is special about the Quran that the content of it has not been changed in the last 1400 years and it cannot be changed because it is the perfect words of Allah. So when you look for an authentic source about what Allah would say or think of Islam or what advice he would give you, you definitely can look to the Quran. So this is our first source we investigate. The second one, and this is very important, Muhammad is our another, another expert. There is something that people rarely know about the Quran. The Quran is actually, if you go to the bookstore today and take one in your hand and start at chapter one and going one by one, first of all, you can see that the first chapter is really long and the last chapter is only one verse. How is it possible now? When the Quran was constructed into a form that we know today, it was actually 23 years after Muhammad's death, that time they decided to put all the chapters in the order of length. Now, why is it problematic? Yeah, except the first one, you can see this is the opening surah which uh, introduces uh, the prayers. But why is it important and why is it uh, uh, causing troubles for us today to understand the Quran? And this is the first uh, secret I tell you. Because the Quran didn't have never come down in one go. It was always uh, event after event after event throughout the life of Muhammad. So what it means that if something happened to, in Muhammad's life, a Quran uh, revelation arrived, and it went on and on. So if you're looking for the context of the Quran, this is Muhammad's life story and all the stories we know about him. And for this, there are two other books that you can also look up. Uh, the one is called uh, uh, Hadis is, is uh, the meaning of Hadis is the stories, the collection of uh, the speech and acts of Muhammad. And Sira means in Arabic uh, uh, biography. So just to make it simple for you, call it Sira and Hadis collection. And uh, there are authentic sources in that uh, where you go to find them. Actually, you can look up what most of the Muslims are using. That's what we're also using at CSPI. And that is the Bukhari uh, Hadis collection. There are three authentic uh, uh, sources. And about the Hadiths, you have to know that there was like 800,000 uh, um, uh, Hadith stories. But there is a 7,000 uh, Hadith this stories collection, which is verified by most of the, the Islamic scholars. Right, so these are our sources, and that's what we, we started to call trilogy. You see, in CSPI, we like labeling. This is the other thing. We really like make things easy, simple to understand, so therefore we introduced some ideas and methodology. And uh, yeah, Muhammad is the key. We mentioned that, so I just skipped this slide. Uh, if you allow me, I, I take this off because now it's a bit hotter. 
So, right, so what is our methodology? Uh, it's very simple, it's based on mathematics and statistics, and the whole methodology is taken over for, from Bill Warner, who is a professor of mathematics. Now, what he did, he took all these uh, sources, the Bukhari Hadith collection, the Quran, and, and an English version of the Sira, and he started to analyze, okay, so when, when we see uh, the, the full amount of the text, what percentage is Quran? Uh, we would always, we have been always told that Quran is the Bible of Islam. But now we understand that no one can understand Quran without the life story of Muhammad and without the Hadith collection. So if you use this, let's say, doctrinal method, you would come to a conclusion that Islam is 14% Quran or Allah, and the rest is Muhammad. So what we do, uh, we would like always approach objectively without emotions and always sticking to the, uh, uh, the doctrine. Because that's what's going wrong. If you talk to Muslims experts, they all have opinions. They have secondary interpretations. They have ideas. They have emotions. But what we need here is a very simple process to analyze a text, check out what is in it. And People can like it or hate our method, it doesn't really matter. What matters that we point out it is in Islam, it is in the doctrine, it is in Muhammad's life. It's not someone find out in a, after a bad dream or waking up not very happily. This is all in the doctrine. So. We need facts, not opinions, and I just give you an example for the statistical method. You know, this is a typical uh, consideration, okay, but Islam is treating women uh, well or badly. Yeah, opinions. But if you can look also human rights statistics, uh, then you will realize that, uh, okay, no, probably women are not very well treated, but then why Muslim people saying that they treating women well and why uh, some Muslim women saying they are happy to be Muslim women. These are opinions, let's see the facts. When you, for example, analyzing uh, the status of women in Quran, you will find verses which are actually treating women equally. There are also some verses which saying that, for example, a woman is a, in a higher status when she is a mother. And there are some verses which saying that you have to treat uh, uh, women not equally, badly, even you can beat them up, uh, it's even described how and on a certain way, it is all coming from the doctrine and from Muhammad's life story. So, okay, let's put the question up. Are those people right who are saying that women are treated in Islam well? Yes, he's right uh, in 5% when we look at the Quran. Are those people right who are saying women are treated badly? Yes, they are right. 71% at least in the Quran, the women are treated badly. So this is one of the other things about Islam which will come at dualism, that you have to understand that there are uh, positive and negative verses in the Quran and they both existing in the same time. You can get a lot more information out of the text that way. That's what we like to do when we have some free time. So uh, we look the anti-Jew text, we look uh, um, how many texts devoted to the jihad, or uh, how women are dealt with, and so on. Now, come to the kafir topic. Um, so what? the doctrine says about kafirs, non-Muslims. Now, this is, it, there will be not much positive verses, I, I have to say, because this is a general trend uh, in the doctrine and also in the Islamic world that uh, the non-Muslims are not treated equally. There is no such a golden rule in Islamic doctrine that what we have uh, in our uh, Christian-rooted ethical system. So therefore, uh, if we just look up those Quran verses which talking about the non-Muslims, they usually can be mocked, enslaved, terrorized, beheaded, plotted against, uh, uh, can be evil, disgraced, cursed. And for me, uh, the most difficult actually, whom, uh, one of the, those who tried really befriend Muslims, is that a Muslim cannot be a friend 
of a kafir, of a non-Muslim. And this is actually Allah's word in, in more than 13 verses in the Quran. So this is the answer why, we, why it's important to know Islam. And you might not feel touched at this moment, but I have to tell you why you are also a kafir. It's often said that the people of the book yeah, uh, that's how referring Christians and Jews, the doctrine, they treat it differently and they have a privileged status within Islam. You have to understand the privilege only goes until the jizya, the tax is paid, and it's never meant and will never mean an equal st uh, status with a, with a Muslim. So, the kafir, the original word, is means someone who is covering, hiding uh, the truth of Allah, and, uh, and what was the truth of Allah is that Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his prophet. And how does affecting this Christianity? We know from Muhammad's life story that he actually very often uh, uh, bought or purchased fruits and vegetables on the market from a Christian seller. And they had a lot of talks together. Sometime after these talks, some revelation came from uh, Allah through Gabriel and some biblical stories appeared in the Quran. Now, these stories were a bit different, and this is actually someone who's studying theology might can be an interesting field of study to see what are those differences. And what you have to understand that according to the Quran, to Allah's word, so not other experts or opinions, Muhammad is the last uh, in the line of the Jewish prophets. And whatever he said and established is overwriting everything what happened before. Moreover, the Old Testament was uh, forged and some changes were made in it to hide those uh, uh, verses which were uh, saying that Muhammad will come as a prophet. So they also say that Jesus was a man and not a son of a god, but a prophet of Allah. And the whole idea of Trinity means polytheistic uh, idea in Islam. They cannot accept anything else on the side of Allah, nor a son, nor Jesus, nor mere no one. So the Trinity as, as an idea is actually a sin in Islam. We also know from the Quran that uh, Jesus was not crucified and nor resurrected, and he will return for a reason to establish Sharia law. From some hadith also saying he will also return to establish Sharia law and kill all the pigs. So basically, uh, we can say that uh, Islam arrived in the seventh century and rewrote everything what we believe about Christianity. And whoever is not accepting the idea that Allah, the only God, and Muhammad is his prophet, is cannot considered as a Muslim. So what left is, is kafir. Uh, I have to tell you, we love simplifying things. Kafir is a term we use very consciously for every kind of non-Muslim uh, uh, personalities who are appearing in the doctrine. This is just a list I brought to you. Who else? affected if you have neighbors and friends. So for example, polytheist, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, pagans, shamans, Zoroastrians, agnostics, atheists, humanists, secularists, followers of no religion. And you can find a lot of Arabic words describing them, shirk, gnostic, uh, al-kitab, they are the, the people of the book. Um, so mushrikin. So, all of these mentioning we handling in our statistics as kafirs. So then, what next? Yeah. Uh, so what comes from the trilogy? What actually comes from the trilogy is what we call political Islam. We believe it's based on that. And I would like to understand, or you to understand, how the whole political religious ideas got divided. So 
when you look at Mohammed's life story in the first part of his, uh, let's say, prophetic career, uh, in the first 13 years, he was living in Mecca. And Mecca, that time, according to the Sira, was a very multicultural uh, society where in the Kaaba stone, when you walked inside and looked around, you could see 360 different gods and goddesses pictures among Jesus, Maria, and others. Um, as uh, uh, a symbol of uh, a multicultural, religiously very tolerant society. So I would say every corner there was a prophet that time. Now, Mohammed arrived uh, into that, uh, let's say, uh, social construction and, and he came up with his um, revelations and uh, he got also some followers. So during that time, he got around 150 uh, people of Mecca becoming Muslim. But uh, we have to understand, and we know this also from the uh, Muhammad's life story and his uh, other stories, that uh, he was not very well accepted because he started to say things to people that you know, if you're not converting to Islam, you are going to hell. And then some Meccans came to him and asked, okay, but what happens to my fathers and grandfathers who already died and cannot convert to Islam? And Muhammad said, oh, they're already on, in hell. So uh, it was a very difficult answer in a society where the respect for the elderly and the grandfathers uh, was, was a very precious thing. So I would say that the, he had more and more enemies throughout that 13 years, but he, he was well protected by his uncle who was actually looking after him and, and you know, it was a, that kind of society where people's uh, uh, positions mattered. So until his uh, uncle was alive, Mohammed was untouchable. But when his, his uh, Abu Talib, his, his uh, uncle died, and on his uh, deathbed, he, he did not convert to Islam. So Muhammad also had to send him to, uh, to uh, the hell. Uh, the people could not stand anymore uh, Muhammad's uh, revelations. So he, he basically had to flee had to flee Mecca, and that was the so-called hijra, which today we can uh, uh, translate to migration. So he migrated with his followers to Medina, where he already had some other helpers, and he started, let's say, a new life in Medina. But in Medina, there were more established Jewish communities who had a very good knowledge about the Old Testament. So when uh, Muhammad started to preach about uh, his biblical ideas uh, based on Allah's words in the Quran, uh, he got refused and not much accepted. So that was a turning point in Muhammad's life because he needed to use some other tools to, to do his life purpose. And that was to submit everyone to Islam. And that was the time in Medina when he became a political leader and an army officer, let's say, and a military personnel, and he started jihad. Now, jihad, we also had this word. You always can hear that, okay, this only means uh, effort on the way of Allah. It's a way of life. Uh, yeah, it, it is true. There are some uh, stories, verses, which uh, defining jihad as something like um, um, effort, for example, when you're fasting. But when you look at uh, the Bukhari Hadith and analyzing the text and finding all the ideas about jihad, in 98% in the Bukhari Hadith, this means violence. So when someone saying jihad is a fight for Allah's cause, yeah, of course, submitting to Islam, anyone, everyone, on any price. It can be with sword, with pen, with speak, with money, with acts. So there are a huge lot of examples from Muhammad's life story. How can you uh, uh, bear jihad? So, so this turning point had a great result nine years after Muhammad died. And basically, in this region, uh, there were 100,000 Muslims already converted. And jihad was a very uh, prosperous, let's say, business. And from that on, uh, let's say, it made sense to do jihad by sword and by other means. 
The other uh, consequence of the, what comes from the, uh, the trilogy, uh, and we also can see it as a tool of political Islam, so we can say political Islam has uh, several tools, jihad is one, and the other one is, um, is actually uh, Sharia. Now, uh, when you see Sharia, some of you would think, okay, it's probably some uh, codex that made uh, not long ago by some experts of Islam. Somehow you're right. There is a 14th century source which we love to use. This is the reliance of the traveler. This is the most accepted by all the uh, Islamic legal uh, schools today. Um, but not uh, all of the Muslim world, but most of them. But what you have to understand that Sharia is based on the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sirah. So when you see, uh, when you open up a Sharia uh, book, uh, then you will see a statement. And this statement is always referenced with uh, quotes from the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. So uh, what comes out from it, and this is very interesting for us non-Muslims to study. Uh, because it seems that according to Sharia, there is no such freedoms that we're enjoying today in the West. There is no uh, freedom of religion, speech, thought, no freedom of artistic expression, no freedom of press or humans, no equal rights for women, no democracy, and no golden rule, and non-Muslims are inferiors with lower social and moral status. Uh, I can tell you one story, another one. I know we, we don't have much time, but I think stories are the best. And, and what we did actually, we, we're always collecting these stories and putting into small books. So whoever is interested uh, in thematically order, they can find. So uh, you can ask, okay, where are all these ideas coming from? And there is a really good example from Mohammed's life story. After uh, one time, uh, when he was already successful in Medina, he was returning to Mecca. Guess what? Not just visit, but actually to revenge. And he had a list of people who has to be murdered because they did something against Allah and his prophet Muhammad. And what was on this list is actually several stories also uh, telling this later, and you can see in the Islamic uh, uh, legal system appearing these elements that, for example, there were some uh, dancers, ladies, who made some uh, basically mocking Muhammad in, in their dances. They were on the killing list. There was also... Um, uh, for example, someone who was writing uh, poems, uh, which was also mocking Muhammad. So every artistic expression uh, which were trying to mock Muhammad and Allah was uh, to be revenged. And, uh, and yeah, we could, we could bring many, many stories. Uh, he had, for example, uh, um, um, a secretary, let's say, because Muhammad was an alphabet, so he was not able to write down the Quranic verses, and he had some helpers in that, and that was a, a person who converted to Islam, and he was making some notes uh, about the, or, or, or noting down all the Quranic verses. And what this guy did, he said that, okay, but this is not uh, grammatically correct enough. Can I correct it? Can I do it differently? And Muhammad said, yes, yes, you can do that. Now, it resulted in this, this man losing his faith in Allah, and he left Islam. And this is one of the earliest examples of uh, uh, when in the Quran and also in the Hadith appearing the, the punishment uh, for living Islam as death. Right. So, uh, I promise that I will, I will make it easy for you and, and how to make it easy to understand Islam. This is actually all about dualism. You have to understand there is a completely different logic within the Islamic doctrine and mindset that we have. Uh, you all at school, you know when we have a test and there is a questionnaire and you have only two options, false or true, you can only tick one, otherwise you don't pass. Now, in Islam, it's an existing logic that something which is true, even if another thing contradicts it, it's also true. And why is it? Because it's coming from the Quran, and Quran is the word of Allah. And who is Allah? The most perfect, the most merciful uh, example or God. That way, he cannot make mistake. 
There is not possible that there is any mistake in the Quran. Uh, there is a story when uh, Muhammad was uh, fighting a jihad and, after, uh, and they had some strategical meeting and the jihadis were asking, okay, so what do we do in that situation? And then Muhammad said, okay, give me some time. He came back with the revelation of the Quran and he gave a verse and then the jihadis understood what they have to do. And one of them said, but look, actually uh, some time ago, you said a completely different advice on that. That was another verse. And then Muhammad said, Okay, okay, this one was true, but this is even more true. And actually, this is the idea which uh, for the analytical um, mindset or, or, or the people who really analytic, analyzing Islam uh, started to use, uh, and this is called abrogation. And abrogation means that every late verses in the Quran, which came later in the life of Muhammad, they are stronger verses, and the earlier ones are weaker verses. Now, you have to know that the Meccan part of the Quran, statistically speaking, is much bigger than the Medinian, so we would have a really good chance here to get a lot of positive, more religious idea, but actually because the second part, the political part of the Quran, which were revealed in Medina and connected very much to the story of Muhammad political and military career, so this part, the Medinian part of the Quran is actually stronger and a bit more true. So therefore, it's really not easy to, to decide even as, as a, a Muslim scholar to see, okay, how do we understand, what do we follow? Because there is always something and, the, and, and the, the opposition of it. There is always contradictions, there is always a positive verse and the negative verse. It just matters which one you, you pick and choose. And that's why we usually take statistics because it's at least showing you the proportion uh, and, and the other fact is that many things are really in the Quran, in the Hadith, in the Sira, which we were told, oh, it's not Islam, it's nothing to do with Islam, it's not there. So, uh, that is the dualistic logic, yeah? And, and I, I hope you can understand that and it's also helping you uh, because then you, you, you can see how, how difficult topic is it, but how easy in the same time, because you have the key now, you understand that it's both end. And I also want to mention that most of the time uh, uh, we say that the first victims of political Islam is actually Muslims. Just, just think of it in, in, in that light that I said. Okay, and then the concept of submission. And we're coming close to the end now. So uh, the submission, uh, is a basic idea in Islam. The word itself means uh, submission or submitting to God. This is a, actually a misunderstanding that Islam would mean uh, peace. We said salam alaikum, salam is the word uh, for peace and it's true that they have two words, has the same root in Arabic, but uh, Islam does not mean peace. It means actually according to the doctrine uh, submission, submitting to God. And the Muslim is someone who is submit uh, himself to the will of Allah. And there is a third category. I mentioned already the dhimmi status. These are those non-Muslims who submitting themselves to Islam which means they accepting to be a secondary citizen and accepting that uh, whatever happens, Islam will rule, but in reverse, they can keep their life. Okay, so just to uh, sum up, uh, we had three different point of views exist today. And, and the first one was the Muslim point of view. Uh, through that mirror, you can read the doctrine, you can understand why some murderous acts are actually victories. There is another point of view, which is the, the point of view of the dhimmis, or we also call them apologists, the apologists of Islam, those people who actually have no idea about the uh, doctrine of Islam, has never read the Quran or understood Muhammad's life story, but they decide I did to make their judgment on Islam just based on their, let's say, um, uh, maybe they have a good heart or naivety. And they say that actually uh, Islam is not what you think, it's a religion of peace, and so on. Our tool, what we're giving to people's hand, is that to understand that there is a third point of view existing, and this is the Kafir's point of view. 
we have the right to look at the text, to analyze them, and to make an opinion about it. And that's what a kafir society has to do. So, political Islam, uh, the politics in Islam, uh, yeah. Yeah, political in Islam is everything that concerns us. It's not the religion. And why do I say this? Because for us, it doesn't really matter uh, how to pray, how to convert, uh, what kind of relationship to build with Allah. These all secondary matters for us non-Muslims. So the religious life is not our concern. What concerns us is what dealing with us, what building societies, what setting up legal systems, and what uh, actually trying to co-live or coexist with our uh, moral, ethical, and legal values. So we are saying that it's political everything in Islam that affecting our life, directly or indirectly. And we have the right to analyze this and point out on that. So, the five topics I mentioned today are quite heavy topics, I would say. I hope you, you, you heard some new information as well. And uh, we were thinking of, okay, so if this is a fact that there is a trilogy uh, with the uh, doctrine, what does it represent? It, it's representing a very strong value system, yeah? So the question is that what do we have in reverse? What kind of values we can set up against offer exchange to those values? The second one was uh, the kafirhood and being a kafir. This means a very strong identity in the Islamic world. They know who they are and they know who we are and it's never equal. So we can put the question up, what is our identity? How humanism, human rights, equality can help uh, us in the future to keep our values. Uh, the third topic we mentioned was political Islam. We talked about there are tools of it like jihad and sharia. Uh, you can see from Iran to Saudi Arabia, even in the 21st century, these are still working systems using 1400 years old doctrinal uh, ideas. And what do we have? Uh, uh, to show up uh, to that is it's our constitution, our rule of law. And this is a, a beautiful field to analyze as well, to see what the Sharia uh, ideas are uh, compared with the constitutional values. There is dualism. Uh, I told you that it's easy to understand Islam, so if, if anyone tells you that, oh, Islam is not like that, you can say, I know this is that and that as well, but did you know that it's also this and this and that? So dualism will help you, and, but you need knowledge for this, and this is a very much missing point. We don't have much knowledge about Islam. I, you know I'm in this topic for over 15 years, but I'm still every time shocked when I realize that people don't know that they, ju they just need to uh, repeat three times these Arabic wor uh, words and they're becoming Muslim. Uh, they even don't know that. So knowledge is essential and, and you have to look for it, you have to study yourself, you have to look into the sources, and not just the Quran, but the Hadith and the Sira. For example, if you just have the Quran, you, ha you will have no idea how to do prayers. This is not in the Quran. How to do prayers, it's coming from the Hadith, from Muhammad's life story. And I could say several other things. You cannot exist uh, uh, in Islam without knowing Muhammad. So, and the last uh, topic we dealt with was submission. And to understand that, that uh, there is submission on many levels and it's pointing to three different point of views. And you, all of you, has to decide whether you want to be uh, more under the, uh, let's say, the Muslim point of view, under the apologist point of view, which is probably the most comfortable, uh, or you want to take on the kafir's point of view. Uh, this will be the, the hardest way, but the, the most fun, I have to tell you. OK. And why is that? Because. What we gain there, if there is no submission, what left? Freedom. 
and freedom is what makes us today able to practice our religion, to live freely, to move freely, to love freely, to do whatever we would like with, uh, with a set of uh, values which uh, coming from our legal system, our constitution and our ethical values of the, of the Christian Jewish uh, heritage. Right, so uh, just a few more lines for, for your route if some of you starting to, to want to be active or want to take it as, uh, on as a field of study. Uh, there are some advice we usually give, and, and that's actually the furthest we go, because we don't know solutions, but we believe that knowledge is the first step towards solution. When you understand what is the problem, when you can separate it from the religion and you can deal only with the political part of Islam, you will see that actually uh, uh, there is a way maybe out. So uh, what we're saying, we say that we, you, you should never ever talk about Muslims, but always about the doctrine. As many Muslims, as many ideas. And our humanistic values are so strong and we understand that Muslims are the first victims of political Islam. So and every one of us has a, an example about the good Muslim and the bad Muslim, an extremist and the kind one. It leads nowhere. This is not uh, something that we have to, let's say, fight on a level of, of people. This is something we have to, let's say, learn uh, on the level of uh, knowledge and doctrine. Uh, never talk about religion, but always talk about political Islam. That's how you open conversations. If you, if you consider Islam as a religion and you start to talk about the religion, you, you, it leads nowhere because of... Uh, because of misunderstandings about the essence of Islam and, and because we know that it's not only a religion. Then, uh, always return to the doctrine and go back to Muhammad's life story whenever you want to debate a topic. Therefore, you need a bit of knowledge, of course, about the doctrine. The other thing, trust your own knowledge and understanding. We are educated, uh, humanistic people, and we definitely can understand anything from Islam what, let's say, uh, anyone from the Middle East or from Egypt uh, can understand. So uh, stick uh, to your humanist and constitutional values. This is what made us free. And be the pioneer of non-violence. And this is our main message. The reason why we're dealing with the doctrine, the reason why we're educating people and want knowledge as an ammunition in our hand is because we believe that violence can be avoided. And we don't need violence and we can avoid violence. If you remember the map I showed you with all those uh, bloody uh, battles, uh, you would say, okay, it's not much hope. We say that the fact that no one has ever tried to fight Islam on an ideological level, to fight political Islam on an ideological level, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. So this is our best chance to, to see what political Islam is, how it's contradicting our values, and then we can, of course, stand up and say if we don't like it, or if we like it. Right, so uh, for more information, we have websites up online. Uh, you can see our slogan, we are saving freedom for future generations, and we, we believe we do that. And you are one of those from the future generations, and your children will be. So come and, and join us if you like. We are an international organization uh, operating uh, in over uh, 12 countries. And uh, in Austria, we also have a branch. Um, and uh, here is a, a beautiful lady who did a lot of work and uh, I'm really proud to, to know her and I would like you also to know her, so please stand up, Eleanor. So she's uh, taking uh, on her shoulders the, the CSPI activity uh, in Austria. So 
anytime if you need something, contact her uh, locally, or you anytime can contact uh, our organization, uh, and, and you can even start activities, uh, translate books, because that's the other thing I mentioned, and uh, it seems like an advertisement, but you have to understand what I'm doing, what we're doing is all of, uh, based on voluntary work, so we do it in our free time, and we don't uh, take money for that. Uh, and these books uh, are sold uh, um, for a price, but we use all the money to print new books. And what we did, and, and this is uh, the other uh, side of our activity, and this is actually the, uh, let's say, the, the work of Bill Warner. Uh, he put together all these um, topics into small books, uh, one inch size, which can be easily uh, read through and understand within a few hours. So you can get a book of Muhammad's life story, the Sira. Our best uh, so, uh, sold book is Sharia law for non-Muslims. Uh, and uh, we have books about Koran. Uh, in English, it's available uh, the topic of women, slavery, um, a lot more. So that's all. And I, and I hope I could inspire you somehow not to be afraid of this topic and, and not to uh, uh, turn away from this topic, but continue on the way to get more knowledge and more power to, to see uh, what political Islam is and how compatible it is uh, with our uh, system. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.